People believe weird things, stupid, absurd things. They can be harmless, but especially in the realm of medicine, false beliefs can be outright dangerous. This book, Healing the Symptoms Known as Autism, is a prime example. So here I'll be taking a closer look at it as a way of showing how to spot bad science. Alarm bells are going off long before I even reach the main text. The strong emphasis put on testimonials is highly alarming, to say the least. Anecdotes are considered to be the worst kind of evidence in science, and for good reason. Apparently, Rivera has encountered this criticism before, as she writes in the preface, While we don't have any double-blind studies to rest on, we do have a slew of anecdotal evidence, which may not mean much to those in the area of modern medicine or modern science. That doesn't make it any less real. There is a reason why modern medicine uses double-blind controlled studies. Without those kinds of safeguards, bias creeps in. The differences between anecdotes and research are enormous. Double-blind controlled trials can tell us exactly how many people took part in the study, how many of them saw improvement with the treatment, how many of them thought they saw an improvement even though they received a placebo rather than any real treatment what side effects the treatment might have, and how many patients drop out of the study for reasons such as severe side effects or difficulty maintaining the treatment. Anecdotes tell us that some people thought they saw an improvement out of an unknown amount of people who tried the treatment. And just as dead men tell no tales, people who tried the treatment and saw no results are not going to make the effort to contact you. That makes testimonials automatically biased. Without controls, there is no information on whether the treatment is the cause of any actual improvement, or if it could just be a coincidence. And there is no way to connect side effects to the treatment or to find out how common they are. I'll leave a link in the description to show a complete lack of any effort on the part of Carrie Rivera to verify any of the so-called recovery stories that she receives. Many ailments have a tendency to improve without any interference, and the human brain is especially versatile. Brain development continues into young adulthood, and children with autism often learn coping skills that help them compensate for their difficulties as they get older. Without a controlled group to tell the difference between untreated and treated patients, there is no way to know how much of the progress is caused by the treatment, if any. By using properly conducted studies, modern medicine has reached its current high level of care, and only with more properly conducted studies can we improve further. I mentioned brain development in relation to autism. Autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder that causes differences in how neurons are connected within the brain. This leads to differences in how people with autism perceive and process information. This book, on the other hand, has a completely different starting point. The foreword, written by Lorna B. Ortiz, Ph.D., bluntly states that autism is, in fact, a combination of immune disorders. This is completely at odds with what we know about autism as well as immune disorders. We know what the signs of immune disorders are, biologically, and we can test for problems with the immune system. Lorna Ortiz does have a doctorate degree. So why would she be saying something so absurd? Well her degree is not actually in medicine, or even a related field. She has a doctorate in chemical engineering, which is why she works at Shell. That in itself doesn't invalidate her opinion, but it does invalidate her as an authority on the topic. The saddest part of this book has been to read how Carrie uses her son as a guinea pig with a total lack of proper investigation in advance, and the consequences this has. The very next day, I saw another girlfriend, and she mentioned that she had a book on ADD and autism, so I immediately picked up the book, and it was all about diet, gluten-free, casein-free to be specific, and I decided to start right away. I also took Patrick to the States to see his first Dan doctor. When I got back home from that trip, I had bought nearly $5,000 of supplements and injectables. Patrick was going to need 40 sessions right away, 
and I wanted to check prices and see if there was a package discount for hyperbarics. We immediately started treating Patrick with IV chelation. Almost immediately, I started working with a world-class homeopath. At that point, Patrick honestly looked worse than before we had started giving him 80 supplements a day. Curry Rivera tells us how she came up with the idea of using chlorine dioxide as a treatment for autism. She claims her great epiphany came from a Google search, searching for chlorine dioxide in combination with virus, bacteria, candida, heavy metals, blood-brain barrier, allergies, and inflammation. She thinks these are the things that make up autism. Again, we know what inflammation, infection, allergies, and other immune problems look like. We can test for them, and if these things were behind autism, we would already know it. It will be part of mainstream medicine, not a fringe group. Chlorine dioxide is a type of bleach and is highly corrosive. This is an overview of some of the safety data on chlorine dioxide. From Wikipedia for a more condensed view, but the same information can be found on a material safety data sheet on chlorine dioxide. According to the EU classification, it is an oxidizing agent, very toxic, corrosive and dangerous to the environment. Let's zoom in on the NFPA 704, sometimes called the fire diamond. Chlorine dioxide has a health hazard level of 3, can cause serious or permanent injury, and an instability hazard level of 4, may explode at normal temperatures and pressures. It's also an oxidant, so corrosive. This really is not meant to be ingested. For comparison, here is the fire diamond of sulfuric acid. And yeah, they have the same health hazard level. Initially, Rivera's treatment has her son vomiting, which she dismisses as a Herxheimer reaction. The Herxheimer reaction would be a real thing if you were actually treating a bacterial infection, which she is not. The fact that chlorine dioxide is an oxidant is apparently a good thing, according to its promoters. Apparently they think that an oxidant like chlorine dioxide will only specifically tug at pathogens without affecting the body. I can't help but wonder what they would think of the people that are promoting antioxidants as supplements with the same lack of evidence behind them. Rivera didn't go into much detail about this idea. She simply states that chlorine dioxide specifically targets pathogens due to their negative charge. I looked a bit further into this and found a site explaining the so-called quote-unquote quote-unquote science behind chlorine dioxide. But that is a topic for another video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and let me know in the comments what you thought.